uh, good morning, everyone. I think we can get started on time again because we still have some leftover things from last time. So last week we talked about uh, using motion as input and we mostly looked at using the motion of the device itself as input, but there's also other, other channels which kind of fall under the big uh, umbrella of motion which you can use. For example, you can use something like this, this is called the, the Mayo, it's kind of an arm band, which uh, actually senses your, uh, your muscle contractions by sensing tiny electrical currents created by your muscles. And so you can, for example, differentiate between different actions you can do with your hand in free, uh, in free space. So you don't have to touch anything, you can just do gestures, and in theory, the device should recognize that. Um, so the idea is that you can use that to control your device by maybe swiping away an incoming call you don't want to take or something like that, or maybe control a presentation. But here, one of the problems again is that you have to train it more or less to, uh, to, to react to one specific user and it's not something you can just hand over to someone else and have it working. Um, related to that is using uh, gestures in free air and recognize them through uh, vision techniques. So um, there's two examples. One is called imaginary interfaces and uh, an earlier one is called Sixth Sense. Both uh, use some kind of camera. Here the camera is uh, on the head. Here the camera is uh, on the jacket. And both of them uh, basically are able to recognize just gestures the user does in free air. So here the idea is that you should simply basically create a virtual screen by doing this gesture and then you can like uh, make gestures on that virtual screen like you would on a touch screen. And with uh, Sixth Sense that actually incorporates a projector so you can stand in front of a wall, get an image projected on there and then use uh, these colored markers on the fingertips uh, to, for example, grab things, move them around, do things like pinch zoom and so on. So this is also an example for using motion as input in the widest sense. Yes, please. Uh, but I think the problem with it is that it needs much more space than, for example, the smartphones. Um, for example, when you're in a crowdy crowd train or something, then you can't do something like this and this. Of course. Yeah, that's, that's of course a problem. Well, um, most of the stuff I'm, I'm going to talk about today are research prototypes. So they're ideas where people explore how, how to solve different, uh, different kinds of problems. And that's not without saying that they wouldn't create other problems like what you, exactly what you mentioned right now. Um, Sixth Sense kind of has, has a provision built in for that because it also has a, a mode where you can uh, project just on your on your palm and then interact on your palm, for example. So um, they kind of thought about that, but you still need enough space to, to stretch your hand. So when you're really in a crowded subway or something, then this wouldn't wouldn't really work at all. Yes, please. Uh, I would like to know how heavy is the, the projector on the camera because they are attached to the head. Um, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine I've had one of those projectors, so all in all, it's maybe one pound. So it's probably too much to, to wear on your head for a, for, a long t uh, for a long time. So again, this is just a prototype. Um, by now, it might be possible to build it smaller. You actually have phones with projectors built in. So maybe, uh, maybe you could do a, a new version of that, which is lighter and smaller, but um, for this prototype, I wouldn't imagine that you could wear it for more than half an hour without getting a, getting a headache, probably. So again, research ideas which may or may not uh, pop up in future products, but right now there's, most of it are still prototypes. Um, this also uh, applies to the next one. This is a kind of a different metaphor. Here the idea is if you have an e-paper display, which is actually flexible and you can there are 
again, prototypes existing right now, which you can do that with. Then you could transfer metaphors from books, like making a bookmark by flipping the, the uh, top of the page or something like that, or uh, leafing t uh, to the next page uh, of content. Then you could uh, use metaphors like this, actually with an uh, electronic device. But then again, of course, you get questions like, how long does it last before it actually starts to, to break down? Um, because uh, the, the mechanical stress will at some point uh, wear down the device, so how long does it actually last? Um, of course, at some point in the future, you might actually want something like a, a display which you can just fold up like a piece of paper and put into your bag, uh, or which you even could even crumble together, but uh, right now, of course, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, a very... Um, very careful bending, just a few degrees, so uh, it can't take too much stress yet. But again, it's an idea of how you can use a different kind of motion to actually put information into a device. Um, then there's uh, one actually quite old prototype, which uh, sort of, uh, again, uses motion of the device itself, but in this case, motion of two de devices simultaneously. So you can actually create connections between devices in this example by simply bumping them together. Uh, so we need again data from the accelerometer, for example, which is in the device to look at uh, similar motion, um, actually quite similar to, to our project right now, and to somehow exchange um, uh, data between the devices then without having to, to do some kind of, of setup procedure again. So, uh, little question for you. So, how would you actually implement this? Maybe not for Erdan, but for, for the rest of you. So, what, what would be a possible solution to do that? There was actually an app called Bump, which did something along those lines. I think it was bought up by Google at some point. So, you could just knock your phone against someone else's phone and then exchange contacts automatically. So what would be a possible, possible solution to that? So how, how could you build something along those lines? Yes? NFC maybe? Hmm? NFC maybe? NFC, oh yeah, okay. That's, uh, then you have to actually connect them back to back, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's actually, actually, I think most modern Android devices actually do that now. So if you actually, uh, if they have an NFC tag and you put them back to back, then you can exchange data. So that's actually a similar one, yeah? Um, yeah, you could also use Bluetooth. So I guess the way it was implemented in the original one was that they looked at similar patterns in the, in the motion of the device itself and then send all those patterns to a central server operated by the company and simply compare those patterns all the time. Uh, if, and if you had two similar patterns in, a, in the same location, basically, then this must have been two people actually bumping their devices and then the exchange of data was done through their server. So uh, that's at least uh, how, how it supposedly worked. Bluetooth would have the advantage that you do, wouldn't actually need a, a central server. In fact, that's uh, just what we're, we're doing in a, in a project right now this semester to do something like that, but uh, without having to rely on any central server. The, uh, again, I think the original app uh, used just some server on the internet and all the accelerometer data was sent there and compared to each other all the time. And as long as you keep it to a very small local area, then you sh uh, this, this should work out uh, most of the time, I guess. So one way of, of using yeah, device motion in a sense. Um, so this one, I don't know if you know this, uh, well, this was a project from last year. This was a bachelor's th thesis. Uh, maybe you've taken part in the, in the study, in fact. So this is also some uh, way of using motion, but now as an output channel. So how can you tell the user something by using motion? If you just have vibration in a, uh, in a smartphone, then you more or less get just one bit of information. But sometimes you 
don't really need much more. And this example, show me the way, simply use two vibration motors uh, at the left and right side of a shoe to tell people where to go. So then you could uh, basically walk around the city still going to some specific location, but you wouldn't have to look on, on your phone all the time. It would just tell you at the right inter uh, at an intersection, oh, now you have to go to the right or you have to go to the left. Uh, and if you, it didn't vibrate, uh, then you could just walk on straight. So sometimes you don't need much more than just a few bits. And um, yeah, so that's where, where even something as simple as vibration could be used uh, as an output channel. Um, in fact, if we look just at phones, then you can also use different patterns of vibration to, to tell the user different messages. They need to learn that, of course, but um, uh, it's still a little more than just, uh, just an on and off information if you basically stretch it out over time. Um, there, actually, there have been several other research projects which also explore that. So there has, for example, been uh, one project which, which used a belt with like, I think, 12 different vibration motors. So it could even tell you quite, quite fine granular dire direction information, which also was used for this kind of navigation. But in fact, if you're just walking around the city, then uh, left, right, or straight is m almost everything you need. Sometimes you get to an intersection where, um, where it's not quite clear if, if it's this road or this road, but even then, if you uh, still have the routing uh, running live on the phone, then it can just correct your route if you take the wrong intersection. And the idea behind this uh, project in the first place was that uh, people would like to explore a little, so they still have a goal, but they would also like to uh, maybe not take the most straight um, route, but uh, look around a little. So also a way of using motion as a side channel in, in a way. Um, if you think that uh, even farther, then you get uh, to, to an even more active version of that, and that would be uh, using the user itself or moving the user itself. That's actually possible. So what you can see here, it first, at first sight, it looks like, a, like a, just headphones, but they actually have electrodes integrated. And they can use that to um, more or less steer the user because if you apply a small current to the inner ear, even through the skin, then you get the, uh, the inner ear is what you use for, uh, for sensing tilt. And this small current, even if I'm standing perfectly still, then I would get the idea or the sense that I'm tilting to the right. And then what I will, of course, do is move to the right so I don't fall over because I'm getting the impression that everything is tilting. And then I would, to, to compensate that, I would move a little to the right, of course. Um, well, that's not something which uh, many people will, will accept outright. So this is a little, more, a little more speculative, but it's still possible. And one application area where this actually would make a lot of sense is in virtual reality. So that you can uh, give people a better sense of, of uh, um, yeah, of, immersion into the virtual wo world and that you can also steer them around. Maybe you've seen this, uh, some virtual environments already use uh, what's called redirected walking so that you can walk for a far longer um, direction than um, what you actually have space. So it kind of uh, subtly steers people in circles uh, while giving them the impression that they're actually walking, walking straight. Um, and something like this might be, might be used to help with that. So in a sense, this is also using motion as output and it's actually moving the user itself. Yes? I think it's helped also because I've heard like mm. this by uh, Professor Borch and he said also that it has medical concerns. Of course, yeah, yeah. So you need, um, uh, you need to make sure that it's only battery powered. So usually as soon as you connect something to, to, uh, to the proper power supply, then you need a lot of, of protection built in to make sure that the user doesn't get an electric shock, basically. So if it's just battery powered, then it's mostly safe, but, um, but still you, uh, 
it, it can if if you have someone who maybe um, has a, has some kind of illness with the ears or something, then it may uh, uh, he may he or she may be more sensitive. So it's really it's really difficult to get this right, I guess. But still, it might be something we m may see in future virtual reality headsets, for example. There's another example related, which I also find quite interesting. Um, this is called muscle propelled force feedback. This is a little more straightforward. So um, as you can see here, that guy has two electrodes on their, uh, on their forearm and they're connected to the, the mobile device and the game running there. And um, what this game now does is uh, trigger an electric current through those electrodes and that will cause the arm to contract basically. And because you're not doing that on your own, but it's triggered externally, what you get uh, is the impression that the phone is actually pushing you down and that you have to push back. So it, it, uh, and that can be used for force feedback in the game. Um, so it really feels like uh, that the phone is getting much heavier or uh, pushing, but in fact, it's just your own arm which is contracting. But since you're not doing that on purpose, because it's not basically triggered by your own decision, then it feels like that the device is actually pushing down. And again, of course, you get uh, safety issues. It must be battery powered. It uh, can actually hurt, I think, quite a lot if you get too much power uh, through the electrodes, because then it's like you, you get a cramp in the hand or in the arm. Um, so this is also not something which is uh, already suitable for any kind of mass market application. But it's, again, it's an idea which you uh, uh, may be able to use in, uh, in a specific context and which actually works quite well as far as I know. So you don't actually need that much power to, to trigger this contraction. And these electrodes are usually quite safe. Um, yeah, but still, for some people, it may be, yeah, it may at least hurt uh, if it's too much power. So still, you probably, if you ever test something like this on people, then you would probably need to sign a lot of uh, of paperwork before they before you're actually allowed to to test that. All right. Um, then one final and very weird concept I'd like to, to briefly mention at least. This is uh, the work from Fabian Hemmert. He's done a lot of similar stuff. And here the idea is that uh, also to use motion as output. And in this case, the device itself will move in some way. So for example, it will uh, have some regular motion like it's breathing. Um, and the more messages you get, the, the quicker and, and uh, more hectic that, that motion will get. So you get the idea that you're a phone is basically uh, stressed out and you should answer your messages. Or um, you get this uh, um, one other variant was a phone that was getting thicker and thicker as, if, if, as you put in more, uh, more uh, storage, uh, more data. And the more storage space you use, the, the thicker the phone gets. So also uh, some kind of, of metaphor for real world um, real world scenarios transferred to the phone. Um, of course, that would need a lot of power and it would be pretty complex to build this into a, a regular phone. As you can see here, this prototype is just a, a shell more or less. Um, but uh, again, it's, it's an idea, a weird one, of course, but uh, maybe it's uh, suitable as, an, as a kind of inspiration for other, uh, for other scenarios. So, um, yeah, mostly just here for, for reference. Um, okay, so um, yeah, to summarize all this motion uh, stuff we talked about, um, we can have motion input. Usually that's done by just sensing where the device is using those micro electromechanic sensors. This time I got it right. And um, we can also use uh, motion as an input by um, sensing different things about the user. Or we can use motion as output. In common devices, that's just one single channel using vibration at most, but there's different kinds of, of research ideas floating around of how you could use motion in a different way, maybe 
by even moving the user uh, themselves. Uh, all right, so that's what was left over from last week. Are there any more questions or comments up to here? <laughs> 